Hello again. We're in part four today of a six-week series called Detox. This is the anchor verse that we're using for the whole series, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And so the writer describes our, our journey of following Jesus, our journey of being a disciple, like a long-distance race, like running a marathon. And he says there are some things that can hinder us, that can slow us down. Sin entangles us. But if we're going to walk into the destiny that God has for each one of us, we're going to need to strip ourselves of the stuff that slow us down. So we're looking at detox, some of those things that would normally slow us down. So we one, we looked at our future and how we think about our future. Week two, detox our body and our health. Last week, Lanny preached about detoxing our soul, our emotions. Today, detoxing our mind, how we think. And in particular, looking at some insecurities that many of us face. If you missed any of the first three, they're on our website, also on the podcast. You're welcome to go and catch up. The importance of our thinking can't be underestimated. Every single one of our actions originated at some point as a thought. All of my poor decisions were the result of poor thinking. Also, some of the good decisions I've made were because of some good thinking every now and then, hoping to get more of those. But our minds are phenomenally powerful, and our thinking affects every other part of our life, including our faith. Did you know that the average person, and I know most of you are well above average, but the average person has between 50 and 70,000 thoughts every day. No wonder you're so tired when you get home, even if you have a desk job. You've been thinking all day. Every second of every day in your brain, there are over 100,000 chemical reactions. Every second. So how we think, the quality of our thinking ends up determining the quality of our life because it affects every part of our life. Let me give you an example. I had a bit of a rough week at work, some tension, some um, niggles, some uh, email threads that didn't go out so well, some misunderstandings, some bad communication. Emotionally, I was a bit up and down, and I dwelt, my thinking dwelt on these negative things, these insecurities, some fears, etc., some doubts about the future, and I ended up having a rough week simply because I was thinking not so great thoughts. Now, I had a wonderful time with Jesus at 3 a.m. yesterday morning because my kid woke me up. So I'm all good now. But just to show that our thinking and what we think about affects our life day to day. Henry Ford is quoted as saying, Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. In other words, the power of our thinking determines often the outcome. Sounded like a little lamb, hey? Meh. So our health, our friendships, our, um, our future, our past, our belief in God are all affected by our thinking. And it's, it's no wonder that Romans 12 says so strongly, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you can change your whole life, transform it, simply by recalibrating how you think and what you think about. All of us carry around some kind of insecurities and our insecurities slow us down they hinder us from this race that God's called us to run so I want to contrast seven different uh, symptoms of insecure thinking and compare them to godly thinking how we should think and they'll come up one at a time on the screen insecure thinking is when I compare myself to others godly thinking is when I'm able to celebrate the success of other people. This thing of comparison lies deep in our heart and it can happen on every level of our lives. We can compare our cars, our houses, our health, what we look like. If you're at school, you compare your marks. 
compare your houses, your business, etc. It's often a sign, not always, but often a sign of insecurity. How do I measure up against someone else? And if you don't measure up, you feel pretty bad about yourself. The second one, insecure thinking, is when I feel I've got something to prove. Versus godly thinking, I live with a deep sense of God's approval over my life. That even if this venture fails, it's okay because God still loves me. I'm not saying God approves of widespread failure when we make bad decisions. I'm not saying that. But, but there are times where we think if we're going to fail, it's the end. No. If you're a believer, God's your Father. He loves you. And even if that thing didn't work out how you wanted, God still loves you. Some of us are trying to prove ourselves to people who aren't even alive. The third mark of insecure thinking, is that I'm only comfortable around people who need me versus godly thinking where I look for ways to empower others. You've probably met someone like this. They're always wanting to help out, always wanting to be there and bring a meal or give a lift or they seem to need other people to need them in order to feel good about themselves. And that's actually an insecurity. We can be looking for people to be not so dependent on us. Fourth one, insecure thinking is where I build cases in my mind against other people to make myself feel better compared to godly thinking which says, well, I can learn from anybody. And this is one I struggle with every week, even this last week at work. There was someone at work who just rubbed me up the wrong way. He submitted some claim. I had to decline it. He pushed back. And I was like, oh, the last time you did this and this and I've got this whole file in my head. In fact, for this guy, a whole filing cabinet in my head. It's the case I've built against him. And I'm wanting to pull him down in my mind and feel better about myself, which is actually pride, which is not good. It's a sign of insecurity. Number five, insecure thinking is when others get complimented, but you feel insulted. So let's say you're talking with two or three people and the one person says, hey, Well done, X and Y and Z. And you leave the conversation thinking insulted and upset that you never got a compliment. It sounds silly, hey? But actually, probably most of us have felt that at some point. Why didn't I get something nice said about me? Compared to godly thinking, I enjoy seeing others fly. And even if they get complimented and I don't, it's okay. Number six. Insecure thinking is when I try to appear as if I've got it all together. Compared to godly thinking, I'm okay to be vulnerable about my weaknesses and my thoughts. I don't know if you feel like this sometimes. When you leave home, you wish the world was blind. Because you feel like you have to dress a certain way and look a certain way and speak a certain way. And what that ends up doing is creating this big circle. We put on a mask, a facade. We try and live up to a certain expectation, what we think others want us to do and live like. And if we dial it back, we realize, actually, that's wrong thinking, but it's so deep-seated in our minds. And this, this pushes people away, trying to live a, an impressionist life, if you like. It, it shuts people out because they never see the true me. They see who I'm pretending to be. Compared to godly thinking, I'm okay to be vulnerable. I've got a friend who, every time I have coffee with him, he's sharing some story of how he's messed up or made a bad decision or ran ahead of God and has to clean up this mess. He's just vulnerable about himself, his kids, his marriage, his business. And instead of pushing me away, because I don't think, I don't judge him like, wow, I don't want to be by you because you have all this stuff going wrong with you actually draws me closer. Vulnerability increases our connection to people. The last one, insecure thinking is when I'm overly self-conscious compared to being comfortable with how God's made me. When we overly self-conscious, it can happen like this. Let me give you an example. You're walking out of church this morning and you walk past some people who are chatting and you overhear two or three words that they say and you think, oh, sounds like they're talking about me. Are they talking about that thing that I did the other week in the car that I don't think anybody saw? 
And you start speculating and you get worried and you get stressed and your heart's speaking. As you get to the door, you look back just to check. And as you turn back, they turn and look at you. And you go, yeah, you see they, they're talking about me. That's overly self-conscious. Overly self-conscious, when you walk into a room, you think everyone's looking at you and judging you. Compared to godly way, being comfortable and confident that if I walk in a room, I'll wonder how everyone else is doing. It changes the lens from in-focused to outward-focused. I'm pretty sure if we had to draw up a scorecard of all seven of those, none of us would be 100% godly way of thinking, godly confidence, right? None of us, I hope, would be on the other spectrum, 0% on all of those seven things. We're all somewhere in between on that process because it's a journey. We're all growing to become more like Him and more confident in Him. So how do we move from a place of insecurity to godly confidence? First thing we need to do is identify negative patterns of thinking and their triggers. Just being able to identify it and give it a name, a label, reduces its power somehow. I can remember as a, as a newish Christian at university, um, we went to these equip conferences. Now equip nowadays for us, is a regional thing because it's grown so big. But back in the mid-2000s, there was a national equip where we would all go, five, 6,000 people to Bloom, indoor stadium, worshiping, hearing God's word for four or five days. And even though it was such an amazing event, I would have this feeling, this unsettled emotion, and I would be quite negative and a bit critical and a bit grumpy. I don't know how else to describe it. And... Um, I'm still learning how to name my own feelings. My wife says, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm feeling something, but I don't know what it is. So back then, I didn't know. But fast forward 10, 12 years, sometimes I sit in a meeting with other pastors who are loving and friendly and smiling, and that same feeling comes into my heart. And I've realized now it's insecurity, these thoughts that are, shouldn't be there, and I feel like I have to try and prove myself to these other people. Which is ridiculous because pastors are the most loving, kind people. They don't judge. <laughs> it's silly when I say it, but I'm just being a bit vulnerable. I battle with this thing. And it's, it needs courage to identify it and name it and call it out. Because when you've lived with it for years, you end up defending it. And looking to blame others and not actually realizing it's a problem that I need to deal with in my heart. And when these patterns of negative thinking become entrenched, the Bible has a word for that. It's called a stronghold. The Old Testament, a stronghold was like a brick or a stone tower, very strong. You could defend that part of the city very well from a stronghold. Physically, it was a fighting thing, a war thing. The New Testament says there are also strongholds, but they refer to our thinking. They fortified ways of thinking, if you like. This is what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 says. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. In other words, we're fighting not with natural weapons, but with spiritual ones. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's ways of thinking. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So these fortified ways of thinking, these strongholds, do you know how they start? They often started in childhood or as a younger person around a point of pain or of trauma. And we start believing a lie and we build bricks around us on that particular lie. So let me give you a hypothetical example. Maybe when you're in grade five, talk about making friends. You're in grade five and you've got a whole bunch of friends in your, in your grade but there's one person, he's your BFF or she's your BFF, best friends forever. For the older people don't have young kids, no, that lingo. My little girl, Briella, she just turned seven and one of her friends gave her a matching necklace, BFF. So she has a BFF. And you're BFFs with this friend and friends with everyone else. And then one day, unexplicably, your BFF, the status changes. They become BFFs with someone else. Oh, Exactly. What happened? I didn't do anything. And you flummox, you have no idea why this friendship has changed. You haven't stolen his lunch or kicked his sister or whatever it might be. 
I'm not using any of your examples. I'm just my kids, right? <laughs> And there's this pain as a child that might go on for weeks. And what have I done wrong? Why, why isn't he playing with me? Why isn't he sharing his snacks like he used to be? What's going on? And you think about it and you, maybe your dad says, well, maybe you're not that good at making friends. Go play Lego. That's probably not helpful, right? Because you end up building another brick on that thing. But this lie takes root in our hearts. I'm useless at making friends. And we start saying it over and over in our minds. Remember, it's a thought. So many times we start believing it's true. And over years, as we grow older and move into teenage years and, and beyond, you know that all friendships, the dynamic changes over time. They don't all stay perfectly blissful all the time. And so every time something little happens, you wonder and you repeat the thought and the lie, you see, I'm, I'm not that good at making friends. I'm not that good at keeping in touch. I do forget everyone's birthday. I'm useless at this. To the point where you repeat it over and over that no matter what anyone else says or what you say, you're believing a lie. Your brain can't tell the difference. And you build this tower, brick after brick around you, this fortified way of thinking around a lie, point of trauma or pain. But 2 Corinthians says that I'm not a victim. I have divine power to demolish, to break down strongholds brick by brick. Amen. To tear down every argument, to take captive the thoughts before they become a brick. To say things like this, well, I might have had one friendship go south in grade five, but that doesn't determine my life. I am a son of God. They revolve around a lie or a, that started with a point of pain. And they need a truth encounter. Often it's because of a mother figure or mother or father figure or father that's happened in the past. But they need the truth of God to break down these walls. And it's a process that doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. And you know, God is so kind that He doesn't like shine a floodlight in our mind that we see all 153 strongholds. Of all the stuff we're not thinking about well, he shows us just one. And we start bricking it down one by one and we, we get a bit of success and we start moving forward on this race. And he shows us the next one. And it's when your parents said, actually we wanted a boy. We didn't want a girl. We got you. As I start unbricking these things with God's help, I start to realize, and the truth of God's word breaks in, and I realize God has never made a mistake. Never, ever. It's human decision and flaws that have created this mess around me. And God's truth comes in to counter the lie that I've believed, that I have no value, I'm not wanted, I have no meaning. I'm just tolerated in this house. So we need to identify these strongholds, these negative patterns. Secondly, we need to have an ongoing revelation of what God says about me. This is the truth we need to counter the lie. We need to hear what God says. Put it like this. We need to wash our brains in what God says about me to the extent that I believe what God says about me more than what anyone else says about me. I have a friend, he tells this story about his friend. He says he knew a guy, he does know a guy, who when he was younger was in with the wrong crowd. Smoking, drinking, drugs, life was headed down a bad path. And at some point this young man met Jesus, became a Christian, put his faith in Christ, started going to church. His life started to change as God worked inside him, as it has with many of us. A few months later he bumps into his old crowd of friends. They start chatting and he's sharing how much God's done. And this old bunch of friends says, you're going to church, they are, they're brainwashing you. And he says, yeah, they are. Because after spending time with you guys for so long and doing all of that stuff for years, my brain needs a good wash. <laughs> we need to wash our brains in that sense. Isaiah says that, 
God's thoughts are way higher than my thoughts. Now, that's not a cop-out to say, well, God is distant, I can't know him. No, 1 Corinthians says that we've been given the mind of Christ by the Holy Spirit so that we can know what God has given us. So the Holy Spirit is active in my world to take God's thoughts about me and make them real in my mind and my heart. That's his job, part of his job. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I would probably walk around believing lies about myself my whole life long. Hebrews 12, going back to that scripture, the writer says, throw off, get rid of, take away the things that hinder, the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so we start this race, think of a start. We start this race with God, this journey of following Him. And as we get going, realize all this stuff is holding you back and God starts to untangle some of the things that have held us back, these strongholds, and we make progress. And the writer says, this is a long journey, a long distance race. You need to have perseverance. And the key is to fix your eyes on Jesus so that you can have perseverance. And it's like Jesus Christ is standing on the other end of the race looking down the track that he has marked out for me. And he's the perfect person. His thoughts are always perfect. His actions are always right. His love is infinite. And he stares down this road and he says, Glendon, come on, my boy. You can do it. But, but what about Glendon? I'm on this side. And I can't hear the words of God because I'm believing lies about myself. And God is wanting to talk into my world and bring light, as Laney said, and shine his light and bring his grace and truth. But often I can't even hear what he's saying because his fortified tower is impenetrable to even God himself. God is always talking. God is always speaking through his word, the Bible. Sometimes he'll speak through a worship song or a preacher who's speaking. God speaks through his people. Friends, we need to hear what God says about us. We need the truth of what he says to break down the lie of how these strongholds are formed. Let me read a few things. And there's hundreds of verses like this in the Bible. Just allow them to settle in your mind and heart. Jeremiah chapter 1. Before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And that pierces through the lie that I have no purpose. Jeremiah 31, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Human friendships, the love is limited. But God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Peter says, we are God's special possession. Not just his ordinary possession, his special one, which means we loved. He knows us. He owns me. He cares about me. Zechariah says, we're the apple of his eye. John, in 1 John, says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Romans chapter 8, if God is for us, who? Who can be against us? And this is why we need to read the Bible and get his word in our hearts and our minds so that we can get a good wash in our brains. Shouldn't make us arrogant. Well, you know what? I'm God's favorite. I don't know. <laughs> That's probably a type of insecurity anyway. But we realize we're all in a process. We're all on a journey of becoming more like him, and that actually we don't need to be intimidated by anyone because we belong to him. So number one, identify these lies, these negative patterns. Number two, hear what God says about you. Take it to heart. Let it be real in your life. And thirdly, we can look back and see how far we've come. It's easy to get discouraged with all that life throws at us. Sometimes we need to just take a breath 
and look back over the months or years, however long you've been a Christ follower, and say, wow, look what God has done. Look how much he's changed in me. For you, it might be weeks or months if you're new to following Jesus. It might be decades if you've served him your whole life. I want to end with this uh, verse from one of my favorite, most favorite hymns, Amazing Grace. This is what one of the verses says. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. T'was grace that's brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. It's God's grace that gets us on the journey in the first place. Maybe this morning you've never put your faith in Christ. You've never started this race of following Jesus. It's His grace this morning that you hear, that you're hearing this. It's His grace that gets us to where we are right now. But that's not the end. It's not just that Jesus at the end of the race. We have His Holy Spirit every day with us, empowering us. God Himself, His grace will lead me home. Can we stand? Thanks so much for joining us for our online church service. If you would like to find out more about us, check out our website, Facebook, or Instagram page. Also be sure to follow us to keep in the loop with our upcoming events. If you would like to get into what God is doing through Hope City Church, here are our banking details. And if you've joined us for the first time, please contact us via email or WhatsApp. We would love to hear from you. Have a blessed week and be sure to join us again next Sunday.